So this is projectile part two. And we are going to be finding the initial velocity of a projectile, which is a little bit trickier than finding the range. All right, let's draw ourselves a little picture. Let's imagine a person standing here. Actually, uh, their arms kind of go up like this because they will be holding a basketball and they're going to be shooting that basketball at a basketball net some distance away there's the net basketball nets are usually around three meters high give or take if we try to use metric 10 feet i think and let's put the person away from the net uh, distance of maybe six meters so far. So this would be probably very close to the three-point line or a little beyond. And what we want to do is we want to shoot the ball up into the air, nice high arc to get the perfect swish, go backward, drop it through the net. So it's a projectile. We're going to assume that when you hold a basketball over your head, you're holding it at about two meters high, which is pretty reasonable. And shoot. we're also going to assume that you're not jumping, there's no jump shot, it's just a standard shoot the ball. Normally you would jump, I guess, if you were shooting from this distance, but it's all about the legs, apparently, right, basketball players? It's all in the legs. It's all in the legs. So what we're going to do is we're going to first draw... Um, our velocity vector, our initial velocity vector, would be a vector that goes something like that. And it will have a certain speed, but this is the part that we don't know. So the question that we're asking is, what is the initial velocity required? What velocity will make the basket? we're solving for that little v, which is something we haven't done before. But we're still going to use the same uh, process. So we have to resolve this vector into its components. And to do that, I'm going to have to tell you what the angle is. So let's figure that we're going to shoot this ball at a nice angle of 60 degrees. So that would also be given to you. The only thing missing in the question would be this V. All right, we can do that. Um, it turns out that this will end up being V sine theta. It's opposite the angle. Right, whoops, not, let's not put theta in there. We know what it is. Let's put the 60 in there. So this will be V sine 60 degrees. Now normally we have a number for the V and we can work it out and get the answer to this. Here we go. But we're not scared because physicists love letters. We just treat them the same as we would numbers. This is still an expression that represents the initial vertical speed. Right? And down here we have V cos 60, which is still an expression that represents the initial horizontal speed. So those are the numbers we have to work with. So let's go down and start trying to develop some equations. We always try to look at the vertical and the horizontal separately. So we'll kind of make a little division here in the page. This will be the horizontal over here and this will be the vertical over here. So if we're looking for vertical information, then V1 vertically, as we just said, is this expression, V sine 60. So we'll write that down. As much as it sounds odd, we'll write it in. V sine 
60. Now we know what sine 60 is, don't we? It's about 0.87, isn't it? So we can actually write that as 0 0.87 for V. And what else do we know about the vertical motion? Well, we know that the vertical displacement, let's look at that. In the picture, we are starting at a height of 2 meters right here, and we are finishing at a height of 3 meters up here. So the change in height from start to finish is 3 meters, take away 2 meters, or 1 meter is the change in height, right? So the final displacement will be 1 meter higher than it was when it started. Vertical. So we have a nice, easy 1 meter here for the displacement. We always have our frame of gravity vertically, so we know that we have negative 9.8 meters per second squared, and of course we know there will be some time involved, which we're not sure of. So we can still write our expression for vertical. D equals B1T plus one half of AT squared. And if we put the numbers that we have in there, we have one meter equals uh, V sine 60 or 0.87 V. So 0 0.87 V, right? Now remember the difference here. This little V1 was the initial vertical velocity. But we have now changed it and written it in terms of the initial velocity of the projectile at 60 degrees. So it's not the same V, is it? It's not quite the same V. Anyway, we also have to multiply that by T. And then if I put the 9.8 in there and I divide by, or I'm sorry, divide by 2 for the half and do the negative sign, we get the 4.9 T squared that shows up so often in these projectile questions. Can't do much with that because there are two variables, V and T. We're stuck. So we leave that alone when we go back to the horizontal and see if there's something here that can help us. And for horizontal, we do have a V. The horizontal velocity is going to always be the same, but in our picture it's up here. It's the co 60, which again we can actually figure out. I'll put it here. I think the cosine of 60 is a half. So this equals 0.5 V. And again, this is the V that we find in the picture in green right here. Right? This V, this red is not quite the same V. So we've, we've eliminated those horizontal and vertical velocities by writing everything in terms of that original one. So that's the V we're after. That's the secret solution to our question. The other thing we have is a D. And if we look at the picture, we can see that the range or the vertical distance that has to travel is 6 meters. So the 6 meters will be the horizontal displacement. And there will be a time that we're not sure of. But, as we've seen, the time for the horizontal motion is the same time as it is for the vertical motion. The time in the air is the same amount of time it has to move sideways. So if the times are the same, and I write an expression, d equals vt, so 6 meters equals <coughs> 0 0.5 vt. I can rewrite this equation in terms of time. 6 divided by 0 0.5 v equals t. And 6 divided by 0.5 is uh, 12, right? So that becomes 12 over v. Remember, the v is still on the bottom. It's not 12 v. The V is still on the bottom. And now, I have a number, 12V, which represents T and can be substituted into the other equation to help me eliminate one of those variables. So let's do that now. We get 1 equals 0 0.87V multiplied by 12 over V, which is kind of handy, because the Vs will cancel. And then 4.9 times 12 
over v quantity squared. Square the whole thing that you've substituted in there. 1 equals, what's 12 times 0.87? We got a number for that? Sorry? 10.44 sounds good. And of course, the v's are gone. One's on the top, one's on the bottom. So v divided by v is 1. 1. I hate to say 1 doesn't matter because it makes 1 feel bad. But in this case, it doesn't really matter, does it? Minus, what's 12 squared? 144, right? And if we multiply that by 4.9, how much is that? 705.6. That's our area code. I wonder if that means something. It's possible. It's possible there's a bigger picture unfolding here. On the bottom, B squared. Remember, you square the top and the bottom in the square fraction, right? Well, this looks solvable. This looks pretty straightforward, actually. All we got to do is move the 10 to the other side, so it'll become negative 10.44. And if I combine that with the 1, that should end up with as negative 9.44, right? And leaving us with negative 705.6 over v squared. Multiply v squared up to the other side. And at the same time, you know what I'll do? I'll divide or multiply both sides of the equation by negative 1 to get rid of the negative. So 9.4 v squared equals 705.6. Then we divide both sides by 9.44 v squared equals 705. Somebody give me that number divided by 9.44. What do we get there? Yeah. 74.4-ish, I think you said? 0.7-ish? 7-ish. And then we take the square root of that, and what do we get? 8.6 meters per second. Now, here's an interesting mathematical little <coughs> glitch that we should consider. When you take a square root, you actually get two possible numbers, don't you? Plus or minus. But when we took this V and we expressed it in terms of sine and cos of theta, I'm going to go back up to the top to show you. What we have to remember is that these values right here, V sine 60 and V cos 60, these represent magnitudes magnitudes. At no point in the solution did I indicate a direction to the math. Right? And kind of let the V pick whatever direction it wanted. And so what we're really doing with the math is we're considering only the magnitudes of these numbers, which means when I get to the end of my solution, what I've actually found is the magnitude of the vector which is uh, coming up here, 8.6-ish. The mathematical way of finding the magnitude of a vector is by taking the absolute value of it, which you know then means ignore the sign, basically. It means all we care about is the number, not whether it's positive or negative. And what we could have done to be mathematically precise is keep these absolute value signs in the expression all the way, but that would have made it look really confusing and complicated. So as long as we remember at the end, we are getting two numbers, but we're really only concerned with the magnitude because we have an angle to tell us the direction, don't we? We don't need a plus or a minus. So it's the magnitude of that number that we're after, and that is the solution. The velocity is 8.6, and so that means you shoot the basketball at an angle of 60 degrees, with a speed of 8.6, then it definitely will follow the path we had drawn, and it will give you the swish every time. So when you're playing basketball, if you call a timeout, run the calculations, you have a much better chance of shooting the three-pointer, right? If only that were the way it could work. But interestingly enough, isn't it cool that Mother Nature knows all about the math and gets it right every time? <laughs>